Good evening and welcome back to another webinar session provided by School of Media Arts and Design, Asia Pacific University, Malaysia. It's a, a wonderful uh, series of session uh, we have been uh, being able to organize uh, because of your continuous support. And thank you for all those who have uh, joined us now, joining us now, close to around 70 watching now. Uh, thank you for the support that you have been uh, providing. So these uh, webinar series uh, is brought to you from the School of Media Arts and Design, Asia Pacific University, as an initiative to uh, create more awareness on trending um, field, uh, trending industry, and um, to make use of this uh, virtual uh, technology that is available in our hands during this MCO period. So thank you very much again for all those who have uh, joined us in today. And um, I would like to uh, share a few, uh, few things with you. Um, the chat section is open for you to actually share your name, your university name, um, and any other details that you want to furnish, uh, which would be a, a collaborative effort. Second, uh, you can use the chat section to actually ask questions towards the end of towards the end of the session so that uh, we'll be able to answer all your queries um, and we I will also be sharing you the feedback form towards the end of the session ensure that you fill in your feedback form so that uh, one we would be able to uh, give you more and better webinar series uh, based on your feedbacks and also when you fill in your feedback form you, we will be able to provide you an e-certificate for participation and we'll be able to send you this uh, as an email within three working days. So thank you again. And on that note, I would like to introduce uh, our co-host for the day. So let me uh, introduce to you my co-host for the day, Mr. Fitri. Hello, Hello Mr. Fitri. Hi. Hello. Yeah. Fitri, uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, as a co-host uh, to actually carry forward this webinar session. Um, Fitri uh, is a colleague of mine and he's from, again, from the School of Media Arts and Design and he is from the animation uh, school. And Fitri is an excellent artist. Um, he, um, he is very, very good in uh, sketching. And then he, especially when it comes to uh, animation uh, characters, and that is what he teaches to our school. So thank you, Fitri, for being uh, here with us today. Um, Fitri, uh, Mr. Fitri uh, has done his BS, B, uh, BA Honours in Animation from Lincoln University and uh, a Master's in Visual Communication and New Media uh, in University Technology, Mara, Malaysia. And uh, he has a very, very um, uh, good working experience with many companies, to name a few, uh, Big Fish Media, uh, Giggle Garage is one of the uh, premier uh, production houses in terms of animation in Malaysia. And one interesting fact about uh, Mr. Fitri is uh, uh, he's a voice artist also. So he lends his voice. And one, one of the uh, animated series that he has uh, worked with is Once Upon a Time. 
uh, which is in 2011. It's a local uh, Malaysian uh, 3D animation series, uh, which he has lended his voice for. Uh, so the reason why Fitri is actually uh, the best uh, co-host for this particular session is because he's an artist. And our uh, uh, webinar guest for today, Mr. Asha Rao, is a motion graphics artist. So it's, it's going to be a combination of art and motion graphics. So I want to put them together on the platform. So art and motion graphics comes to you uh, to present this uh, webinar, actually. So thank you very much, Fitri, again, for being here. On that note, I also like to bring in a guest for the day, Mr. Asha Rao. Hi, everyone. Asha. Hello, Asha. Uh, thank you very much for blessing to uh, do this uh, webinar series for us on uh, art and motion graphics. Thank you very much, both of you. Uh, I would like to uh, leave Mr. Fitzy to take it from forward from here. So I will meet you post the session. OK. All right. Um, thank you very much, um, my colleague, Mr. Edwin. And <clears throat> hello, everyone. And thank you for joining us today. And I will be your you know, co-host for today. and. <clears throat> uh, give a little bit of introduction about today's topic. So our main topic, uh, which is going to be presented by Mr. Harsha right after this, is called um, Art in Motion Graphic. So being um, someone from the, the artistic um, field as well, I have seen that a lot of um, uh, technology being advanced, uh, like for example, in the world of advertising, that that the, the, the medium have changed from a flat image into a moving picture or, or a screen, for example. And, you know, in order for you to be able to successfully and beautifully apply design in, say, for example, in this case, advertising, you need a lot of art and you need a lot of um, um, the application of art as well. Um, being able to understand what art is, being able to understand how to produce um, or how to approach uh, a certain design issue or design trend uh, through an artistic approach. And I think that um, there are no one else that will be more suitable to talk about this um, besides my good friend, Mr. Harsha. And <clears throat> just a little bit introduction about um, who Mr. Harsha actually is. Now, uh, I've known him personally for about five years now, I think. Um, and Throughout my experience, having the opportunity to have worked with him, both on um, design section as well as educational section. And I would say that this person has a, a huge amount of respect and a huge amount of passion towards uh, his craft, right? And, and being from the, the, the design industry, having worked with the design industry for over um, 50 to 16 years, I, I would I would say, as well as being uh, an educator for more than 12 years, um, I think um, it speaks volume about his capability and um, as well as his um, creativity in terms of giving the the, the best, uh, putting the best out, output, uh, artistic output out there, um, especially in you know in the fields of motion graphics. So. Yeah, without further ado, I would like to pass on this session and I hope to learn a lot more from, from you, Arsha. And and yeah, take it away. And thank you very much, everyone, for joining. I will see you guys again later. Yeah? Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Eddie and Fitri. Uh, feels great hanging out with you guys uh, virtually. I know we used to hang out in at work uh, all the time and you know having coffee and stuff. So it's always great to hang out with you guys. So um, yeah, I'm actually going to share my screen with you all right now. So I think most of you should be able to see my slides. So uh, the title of today's uh, webinar is actually called Art in Motion Graphics. And uh, it's basically one of, a, one of my very strong passions, which is art and also combining it with motion. Because I always like to see things move and I always like to experiment with new styles and techniques and so on. So um, without further ado, I think I'm going to start with my presentation.
So first of all, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Harsha. I am a graphic designer. Uh, I studied multimedia and graphic design way, way back in 2007. Um, I've worked in industry as a graphic designer, as a multimedia developer. Uh, I worked in uh, application development for um, a, an old software called Flash, which no one uses anymore. But uh, after a while, I decided to join the education industry, and I've been with Asia Pacific University since uh, 2008 as a lecturer in graphic design, uh, multimedia, as well as advertising. Right now, I'm actually the program leader for the digital advertising program in Asia Pacific University. And I've been doing this for about three years already. So uh, my, my main passions are basically doing things like poster design, working on visual arts. Uh, I also like to experiment with conceptual UI UX. Uh, UI UX is basically user interface, user experience, but uh, not in the sense that you would see in things like apps and stuff, but more of a conceptual ideation uh, you know, in a very creative way, I suppose. Uh, and finally, the thing that I, I really want to talk about today is actually the, the concept of motion posters, which is something I've really been passionate about recently and I've been really focusing my, my attention towards. Uh, there's a little QR code there for you if you want to um, you know, scan it. You can actually check out my Instagram page while I go through this uh, webinar with you. So um, I started my career back in uh, two, 2000, I guess early 2000, where I learned uh, graphic design uh, on my own. As a, I was self-taught, basically. Uh, I picked it up as a skill because I always wanted to you know, play around with animation and play around with design. And uh, it was interesting because at first, I, I, I didn't really have any difficulty. I kind of felt like a fish in water when it came to graphic design because I was really interested in doing it. And, and I usually love to sketch on paper. And it was just translated into design software. So it was a really fun experience for me when I started as a young graphic designer. Um, and the thing about this webinar is I, I really we wanted to set out some aims before we started the webinar. Uh, so you guys all have an idea of what I plan to do today and what you will basically learn from it uh, or a way to look at it would be learning outcomes. So my aim for this webinar in the end of the day would actually to be to inspire you because uh, the world needs more graphic designers. The world needs more artists. The world needs more designers. Um, Everybody can be a designer. Everyone should try to become a designer at least once in their life. Uh, it could be designing things like um, posters, logos, various other kinds of stuff as well. So I really want to inspire you by showing you the work that I've done. And one thing I would like to also add is that most of the stuff, almost every single design that you see in today's presentation is actually designed by me at one point in time of my life. The next uh, aim is basically to introduce graphic design as an art form. A lot of people assume that graphic design is something that is mainly used for commercial purposes because uh, we see graphic design in magazines, in advertising, uh, posters, websites, uh, even places like Instagram and stuff. It's of often used for advertising or commercial purposes. But I feel that graphic design has broken that barrier and has got into that stage where it can actually be considered as an art form. And in fact, a lot of famous graphic designers are now converting or even creating more pieces of art through their graphic design. And finally, I would like you to also experiment and explore new styles. This is really important because graphic design is an evolutionary thing. It's evolving over time and the same way uh, the styles will evolve, the trends will evolve, the way you do things will evolve, the softwares that you use will also evolve. I mean, to be honest, when we all when we started learning graphic design, we were still using paper and pen and sketching and creating typography on paper. But now everything is turned into software-based education. Uh, and most people who are learning graphic design right now actually don't get that uh, traditional way of doing graphic design. But um, that's just a point, part of life. I mean, we get new tools, we get new technologies, and at the end of the day, we adapt. We learn and we adapt and we just make really, really cool stuff using these technologies. So it's really important to know that graphic design is not about the, te the technologies that you use, but it's the thoughts that you have, the creativity inside you, the ideas that you create. That's the most important thing. So go out and experiment and explore new styles after this webinar, that is. So um, I actually realized at a very young age that 
I really like to do logo design. So uh, back in my uni university days, uh, one of the easiest way for me to make some side business or side income was actually to do logo design. And I was doing a lot of logo design for a lot of different uh, companies, for friends. I was also doing logo design for uh, podcasts recently. In fact, when the podcast uh, podcast industry blew up. I started doing uh, logo design for podcasts. I was doing logo design for uh, Twitch streamers as well who do who do things like esports. I've, I've worked with a lot of different people in terms of creating logos. Uh, and logo design is something that I really thought would be a career that I could get into. But the, the, the problem with logo design is that after a while, you keep doing it and doing it and doing it. And you, you kind of come to a point of time where you realize that, okay, you know, I've been doing all this for commercial purposes, but what about for myself? What am I doing for myself? And this is why I figured that graphic design can actually be converted into something that can be thought of as art. And that's why today we're going to be talking about art in motion graphics. So uh, this is actually one of a series that I worked on very, very recently, maybe about two years ago. And I, I call this series Break Out of That Box. Uh, a lot of times when you look at graphic design, uh, a lot of times graphic design is uh, restricted in boundaries or frames. And I actually wanted to see how I could create art that actually broke out of the boundaries and uh, maybe even just came out like liquid, just flowed out of the boundaries and really, really took out of context and also made it look very different and very unique. And I, I really, really like playing with gradients. Gradients is something that I really enjoy working with. I really like to experiment with new gradients. Uh, I actually follow a lot of designers who mainly create gradients. And I really like to try to incorporate gradients into a lot of my work. Uh, I also work with a lot of lines and a lot of different types of motifs as well. So. Uh, in today's presentation, you'll see a lot of my work and you'll ba basically get an idea of the kind of stuff that I do and why I design it this way. So the Breakout of the Box series, uh, I actually designed it for Instagram. I posted it up on my Instagram and um, I really was shocked to see a lot of people actually liked it and a lot of people really found it very interesting and very engaging. And it actually inspired a lot of people to create their own designs this way as well. So I got I got to the point of thinking like, you know, why are we constraining ourselves into a frame when we do design? And it's really important to kind of get out of that frame and really explore how we can create very, very interesting graphic design in a different manner. So this is another example of one of my very early stages of work. This is Life Aquatic Scenes. So Life Aquatic Scenes was actually created for a magazine, a pop culture magazine in Malaysia. Um, and this pop culture magazine, of course, it no longer exists, but it was very much apparent back in the early 2000s. So um, they used to feature a graphic designer every month and they used to print a poster with that graphic designer's work on it. So I figured, hey, you know what? This is a good opportunity for me to actually get my designs looked at and also uh, accepted by the community. So I created a, a concept which is called like Life Aquatic Scenes. So Life Aquatic Scenes is basically using various different objects that we see in life or in aquatic scenes incorporated with a lot of geometrical um objects or geometrical shapes and forms, okay? So again, you will see a lot of gradients in this these designs as well, because like I said, I love gradients and I use a lot of them. Uh, I use gradients like for the backgrounds, for example, with, with really deep greens, uh, you might call it opal greens in a way. Uh, and then I, I like to use things like characters which stand out and pop out of the background. I also started working with things like uh, typography. So that's why I use a lot of different types of fonts in my artwork as well. So uh, as you can see, the first one is actually, uh, it's kind of like a mecha in a way. Uh, it's, a, it's a mecha that, that kind of works in the underwater realms. And the second one is actually, uh, sorry, the first one is called Aqua Valva, which is the mecha. The second design is called Nalumbo Nucifera. Nalumbo Nucifera is basically the Latin name for the lotus. And I've always been fascinated with the lotus. Lotus is one of my favorite plants because it looks so amazing. And it, it, it looks like it's something that was designed by a designer. I mean, it's so intricate and it's so cool to look at. I, I've always been interested and intrigued by how the lotus is designed. So I, I really wanted to incorporate the lotus and I wanted to pay homage to the lotus by giving it giving this design the title Nolumbo Lucifera, which is the Latin name for the lotus. 
Yeah, so I also incorporated a lot of pinks and a lot of purples into this to create various different gradients with a bright yellow in between to kind of kind of give it that 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 feel of a sunlight or something breaking out of the lotus itself. Finally, the the third the third uh, piece of this life aquatic scene is actually an octopus. Um, Maybe you might you might get it, you might not get it. It's actually an octopus, and it's titled Octoplasma. And um, I've always been fascinated with octopus as well. Um, I, I'm a big fan of H.P. Lovecraft. I don't know if any of you here would have heard of H.P. Lovecraft, but H.P. Lovecraft is a very famous author who does uh, cosmic horror, and one of his famous creations is it's actually called Cthulhu. And I've, I've actually incorporated a lot of uh, Cthulhu and H.P. Lovecraft-esque designs in a lot of my work as well. It's very heavily inspired by him. So uh, the next piece, this is actually Artemis Voyager. So um, my idea behind this piece is basically I wanted to create a futuristic interface. And this was one of the first explorations I had into UI UX. So UI UX is basically user interface, user experience. So I was really wondering, like, if we were to create a space Voyager, what kind of interface would we operate with? What kind of interface would, would uh, a human being um, work with when they were traveling through the outer dimensions, for example? So I thought of creating a, a conceptual U UI UX for this, where uh, I called it Artemis Voyager 1138. Uh, 1138 is actually a, a movie by... Um, uh, George Lucas, THX 1138. It's it's a it's about a dystopian future. If you haven't watched it yet, you should. It's amazing, and I I really like to incorporate a lot of movies, video games, and cyberpunk culture in, into my art as well. So Artemis Voyager basically is my opinion or my idea of how an interface for a uh, a space Voyager would look like, all right? So um, basically, we have operation selections with a with a dot exe here, which is an executable. Uh, oh yeah, by the way, I would like to also say I actually come from a programming background. It's hilarious because I actually studied uh, my diploma in computer science and I studied C plus plus programming. And yeah, design is a really you know long way from programming, but I feel that both both uh, worlds can intersect in a way. And I, I've always been fascinated by programming, but I'm never good. I was never a good programmer to to begin with. Uh, I tried programming. I did a bit of programming here and there, but yeah, no, it never. It was never something that I was really passionate about. But on the other hand, design that's something I loved. And I and I thought, hey, you know, it wouldn't it be really interesting to kind of incorporate user interfaces with design. So um, these these basically these one two three fours are depictions of folders in in a space Voyager where. Um, explorers can actually store their information inside it and you can actually select different operations and the, the the interface would actually move as you work on it so mind you this was basically before i started exploring motion graphics so i was still kind of thinking how uh, user interfaces would look like and uh, the last one here, this is the uh, configuration panel of the Artemis Voyager. And you can actually take a look at the status signals. Uh, you have system load, payload, fuel load, and shields. Because, I mean, when you, whenever you watch sci-fi films like uh, Star Wars, Star Trek, you will see a lot of uh, these kind of elements inside it. So I figured, hey, you know, having a fuel gauge on it would be quite cool. And having a shield reactor to tell the, you know, the, the Voyagers, like, what's your shield status and stuff would be quite cool to look at as well. So yes, uh, Artemis Voyager was really fun to work on. And I really like to also incorporate that 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 supernova explosion background behind it. And that's one of the things that I, I really like to see in a lot of my designs, because I like to put in a lot of textures in the backgrounds. Uh, the textures help my my actual graphic design assets kind of pop out of screen and kind of have a life of their own. All right, so um, this is a, a collaborative project that I worked on with a with a with an Instagram group called Nestup. Um, so one of the interesting things is um, if you notice on the right hand side here, uh, we have a an iPhone X. Uh, I really love the design of the iPhone X. When this particular phone came out, I was impressed. I love that notch design. It looks so cool. It looks so futuristic. And I, I was obsessed by it. I, I mean, obviously, I couldn't afford an iPhone X at that time. So I ended up buying an, an Android that looked somewhat similar. But, you know, it, just, just the look of it just spoke so much about design. And it really told me that, you know, we've got to this point where phones can be 
you know, a full whole whole screen. It doesn't even have to have bevels, and it's it's the entire thing was just a screen, a body in the screen. So I was really fascinated by this design, and I really incorporated uh, the iPhone X or the the shell casing of the iPhone X into a lot of my designs. So Ampersand Avenue, uh, powered by Nest Up, it's actually a conceptualization of a imagine a futuristic cyberpunk dystopian future where you go back home and you have something like an Alexa, but you could control it with your device. So the tagline I used was ultra modern elitist living spaces. So these are basically living spaces that you could control with your device. So this, mind you, this was also before the, you know, before Alexa and so on. You can actually look at my Instagram to see when I posted these designs out and you'll notice that they were a few years ago. And we were still getting the hang of you know, uh, smart homes, um, looking at how we can use uh, smart technology in our lifestyles as well. So uh, the Nest Hub interface actually comprised of a few different elements. So we had a heart there, which actually told you your health. So imagine going into your house and then you have a sensor that could actually tell you your health, your daily health, how you felt on that day itself. Um, then it also gave you the temperature. Uh, there's also a recycling system there because uh, my assumption of the dystopian futures is that it would be very polluted and uh, recycling would be a common uh, common thing that we would do and having that would actually be useful for us. So uh, I actually incorporated that thing where you can actually see what, what waste your house is actually producing and how would be the best way to actually recycle that waste. Um, the, the, the little lightning sign, that's actually an action button. So it's an action button which actually lets you go to a different menu. You can actually check out the, the other designs of this on my Instagram. Uh, and then you have music because, I mean, who doesn't love music? We all love music and music inspires all of us. So um, obviously coming into your house and being able to listen to that that song that you really love, uh, the minute you walk in, that's awesome. I mean, that's really fun. And I would really like to see that in, in, you know, like future technology as well. And the last thing is actually a dinner table setup. So it, it could actually tell you what you're having for dinner. And also maybe even uh, if, if there were technology such as robotics, it would even be able to prepare dinner for you. Um, the Ampersand Avenue interface also tells you the time, the temperature, and other information that you need as well. And uh, the, the idea I had was it, would sh it should be something that's very versatile and very dynamic or a very modular interface, which would move as you select different things or as you interact with it. So it's always evolving based on what you need. And it should be smart enough to also tell you what you need. So this is why I thought, hey, you know, it's, it's, it's getting to that point in the future where we should start thinking about how our interfaces would work for us more than uh, us working for the interfaces itself. Okay, moving on. So um, this is another collaboration I, project I worked on. Uh, Above Average is basically a, a setup in Miami, Florida. So they're, they're actually an Instagram setup. And uh, what they do is basically they create a conceptual UI UX and they post it on Instagram for... Uh, you know, just to just to get people to see what they're thinking of, and they actually work with a lot of different designers from all around the world. So I was one of the first designers they approached to actually work on a project with them. So what I did was that I actually came up with a with a graffiti style artwork, and I kind of incorporated it again in the iPhone, and um, I also incorporated it into a slider menu because um, slider menus are really really cool and intuitive, and we tend to use them a lot nowadays, especially with our with our mobile in, in interfaces. And uh, in fact, I've actually brought in a lot of other designers to work on above average projects as well. Um, in fact, a lot of my students from our university have also collaborated in above average. So I've actually included the Instagram handle there for you to take a look at their work. And maybe you might even see some people you know, so that'll be pretty cool. So the idea behind above average is basically to create futuristic interfaces which don't exist today. So taking uh, elements like uh, the smartphone, the smart watch, uh, using biometrics, so you may see the thumbprint scan and so on. So how we can in, uh, interact and basically put these things into an interface and uh, conceptualize it to something that can actually be seen uh, today rather than in the future. Uh, the next one is actually another project that I worked on with Above Average. So uh, a long time ago in on Instagram, I worked on a project uh, called Invasion. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned just now, I really love watching a lot of sci-fi um, and so on, and playing a lot of video games as well. 
So I, I had an idea of what would it be like for people to tell a story about an alien invasion? I know talking about aliens is a bit far-fetched, but hey, you know, this is what I like and this is what I'm passionate about and what I'm interested in about. So I really thought, you know, what would it be like for a narrative where people are talking about an alien invasion happening in their own city? So it was spread out in a nine-day sequence. So there were nine stories being told by nine different people within a particular city and basically telling about talking about the changes that was happening in their city as this alien invasion was happening. And uh, before you know it, AXA or above average, again, they contact me and said, hey, dude, we like the stuff that you're doing. Uh, I think it's a cool opportunity for us to incorporate it into a design as well. So I said, you know what, why not? So I did the same thing as well. So with the with the top right here, I added the, um, I actually created some sort of um, media player. So it's actually a music player integrated with some buttons and so on, uh, which allow you to kind of use the interface on the left and the right hand side. And again, I also incorporated the slider system because after all, that's something that we tend to see a lot with a lot of in our mobile devices as well. So um, Invasion actually got a lot of uh, recognition from people. It it made a lot of people, um, it inspired a lot of people actually to create their own stuff. And I got a lot of positive feedback from creating this particular project, uh, mainly because uh, it was really out of this world. It, it was talking about something that not many people talked about because normally we when we talk about alien invasions, we're talking about like heroes and villains, like um, people saving the day, but we never really look at the consequences of something like that. So I really wanted to look at a narrative where the people in the city are telling their story about what's happening. And I found it like, it was it was fun to work on and it, it allowed me to kind of also play around with my uh, copywriting skills. I mean, I, I do work, I have worked on copywriting work as well in the in the past, but never, never in, in storytelling. So I thought, hey, you know, it'd be really interesting to actually tell a nine part story that it was that revolved in nine days on my Instagram. And yeah, little did I know it actually did very well. And a lot of people were impressed by it. And, you know, I, I felt very proud after posting this up. And another thing that you might notice with a lot of my designs is that I also tend to include a color palette somewhere in the design because, I mean, I love color palettes and uh, it's always cool to kind of highlight the color palette because it's it's a geometrical shape as well. And I, I like to play around with the design of my color palette as well. So I'll also be sharing a little bit on color palettes later in my, in my design, in my uh, presentation with you guys. So this particular color palette uh, worked with a lot of... Um, sober light colors but mixed with a lot of darkness in the in the ground level basically so uh, as i mentioned just now color selection and color palettes so uh, this is actually another project that i worked on um, this is another user experience or user interface user experience ui ux project um, i called it the banshee experience so um again going back to sci-fi and computer games and video games uh, Banshee is basically a mech and how would someone um, operate a mech and how would we, you know, imagine um, if you watch movies like uh, Pacific Rim where you would, you would actually be controlling, a, 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 I guess you call them Jaegers, I guess, I think so. Yeah, so basically these, these giant mecha robots and how you'd interact with them and how they would interact with each other and so on. So a Banshee experience was actually looking at the 4th Battalion Attack Squadron of the Banshee uh, units, basically. So I worked with a color palette that comprised of uh, bold saffron colors, uh, deep saffrons, light mandarins, fire opals, and Persian greens. So uh, I used Persian green primarily for the background because I figured that these saffrons and fiery colors would actually pop out a lot more on that Persian green background. And yeah, it actually did. They really popped out. And uh, for my design elements, I worked with a lot of geometrical shapes, especially badge designs. So you'll notice a lot of badge designs in this particular project. Uh, I worked with color gradient shapes as well. So you will see a lot of color gradients being integrated. So you will notice also like bold saffron, deep saffron, light mandarin, and fire opal is, is in fact a gradient. It's from light to dark. So incorporating this into the design actually was like a gradient, but being separated into different color selections. Okay, I also incorporated a transparent badge overlay with a lot of opacity on top of it. 
uh, I applied a lot of def decorative glyphs and symbols to this particular design as well to give it a bit of depth. And uh, I also kind of wanted a bit of pixelation because, I mean, I also have always been a fan of pixel art. Uh, and I, you know, growing up in the in the nineties, I was uh, I played a lot of video games that that was pixel art basically. So I really love pixel art as well as as a as a you know an art form. So I wanted also incorporated. So I did. I've, I'm not a great pixel artist. So I just wanted to incorporate decorative glyphs and symbols in the form of pixel art. So I added that in. Uh, another thing that I put into it, it was the minimalist character design. So you might be able to see on the left-hand side, the, the little mecha there, which is very minimalist. It's almost like a, like a, a silhouette of a mecha that someone would control. And finally, the Persian green, which is used for the complementary color background, as I mentioned just now, because it really makes all the gradients pop and all the gradients stand out when you use a Persian green background like this. Oh yeah, also um, the, the the font that I'm using for some of this is actually uh, all available on a website I'll be sharing later on as well with you all. So this is actually the Banshee experience. And um, this is the full um, design of the Banshee uh, war paint. So I call this a war paint. So this is a, an emblem that you would see on the Mecha or the 4th Battalion Attack Squadron of the Banshee units. So what I wanted to do is also create different badges that were incorporated in, in the Banshee units. So these are the badges on the bottom right-hand side. And uh, you will also see the simulation. And this is actually... Uh, one of my first explorations into motion graphics. So uh, like I said just now, I wanted to uh, take my Artemis Voyager project further and I created something where, where I could actually simulate the interfaces. So this is my uh, fuel gauge simulation. So what you would actually see is uh, a, a simulation of a fuel gauge and how the fuel gauge would move as, as a person would you know, uh, work, on, work on using this particular uh, interface. For the number two is actually the exosuit nodule simulation. So this is more like a health simulator. So uh, if you play video games, I think most of you would know what a health bar is. Uh, health bars basically tell you when the boss is hitting you really badly and hey, you need to put on, you need to either put on better armor or you need to get a health pack so you can survive. So, you know, um, I wanted to see how a health a node simulation would look like. So I created a health nodule for this Banshee experience, basically. So the, the health bar would actually increase and decrease over time to indicate that, uh, the you know, basically the, the, the mecha was either losing health or gaining health over time. So there's also the loading loading bar there to kind of tell you to or to signify that the, the health was increasing as well. The next was the arc core simulator. And this is basically the heart of the mecha itself. So um, the arc core is my, I guess you could say, my uh, envisionment of how a mecha would actually function and what made the mecha actually move and work. The art core is actually the heart of the mecha. And this is actually the simulation of how the, the mecha's art core would look, would look like and work. And I wanted to incorporate that heart beating kind of feel to it as well. That's why I added little circular motions and circular motifs that, that move over time to kind of signify that the mecha's heart was beating. And uh, I wanted to differentiate it from the health bar. So it, it's not something that's actually rising over time, but it's something that, that's beating over the course of time. So I've also incorporated the load bar, as you can see, a lot of little mini mini interface elements also into it, moving objects and so on. And as you can see, even the typography being used here is very reminiscent of pixel art, because like I said, uh, it really gives me that video game sort of vibe. And that's what I really wanted to kind of show with the Banshee experience overall. So yeah, that's that's the Banshee experience, and it was it was a really fun project to work on because it let me exper experiment with um, user interfaces in a very futuristic manner, and also uh, try to incorporate things like gradients, also with with various different color schemes and so on as well. So um, then it really got me thinking, yeah, um, what if my art or what if I could make my art move? And that's something that I always wondered, like looking at a poster, it's very uh, one dimensional or two dimensional in a way, because it's it's very uh, static. It's not really moving. It's, um, it's just there, you know, it's something that you might see hanging on a wall 
or something that you would see as a poster somewhere. So I really thought to myself, what if I could make my art move? And this is where I thought about art in motion graphics itself. So I, I started learning and I started picking up softwares. Um, I learned Adobe After Effects. Uh, Adobe After Effects was something very foreign to me at the beginning. I really did not even know what it was. Uh, my, my, my knowledge of video production was mainly Adobe Premiere because I used to do video editing at one point in time as well. So After Effects was something very, very new to me. And I thought, you know what? I have to pick up this software if I want to make motion graphics and if I want to make art that moves. So I, I really thought, you know what? Um, it's, it's now or never, I should go ahead. And I took the plunge and I started learning this software, which is um, Adobe After Effects, basically. So uh, the two designs that you see in front of you is basically structure and diagram. Um, structure and diagram is an experimentation in uh, pop art. Um, pop art is very retro style and it encompasses a lot of uh, pop design, so things like uh, circular objects, uh, square shapes, a lot of grid lines, a lot of uh, fluid movements, and so on and so forth, uh, arrows as well. So pop art is something that you may see in a lot of uh, old retro posters and a lot of retro advertising as well. So I, I figured, you know what, it'll be really cool to actually design pop art in uh, in the sense that it's not being used for advertising, but more, or even commercial, but more as design and art itself. So structure and diagram. And I also created a few other designs that revolved around the same concept of pop art for this particular uh, concept of mine. So again, I thought again, uh, what if I could make these designs move? So um, the next project I worked on was actually taking these designs and incorporating them into animation works. So um, as you can see here, the, the design on the left that you saw just now, that's um, structure. And this is structure being incorporated into an objectified or objectual, objectual design. And um, it's actually a circular moving motion with um, a lot of objects kind of revolving around it. it. It's supposed to depict a shutter, like a camera shutter in a way, or a focus lens or a lens that's focusing on something. So almost like the lens is focusing on the design. And as the lens focuses, the design would get blurry, distorted, and change at the same time. So this was uh, it was a fun project to work on, but you know it was it it had its limitations. Of course, the the designs were very uh, simple, very basic. I was working with very basic motion as well in this particular project. I did work with a lot of transparency effects too, but like I said, it was still very basic. So you know what I wanted to do? I wanted to push myself further. I wanted to break that boundary. And then I thought, what better way to do it but to actually work on the, the next design, which is uh, my second design, which is the diagram. And uh, for diagram, what I wanted to do was actually create tangerine. And uh, some of you may have seen this design in the uh, Art for Motion Graphics teaser video. So yeah, I created this um, with the same design that I showed you just now, which is um, the diagram. and I called it tangerine because the colors really reminded me of a tangerine or a tangerine orange. It's just a burst of color. There's so much stuff going on that it just really pops. And uh, there's a lot of motion in this design with the arrows moving upwards, downwards, circle, circles kind of in expanding, uh, also compressing. And the whole design itself, adding motion to it, really made it come alive. So um, I also started thinking about the, uh, you know, I mean, after all, everybody wants to, I guess, make money off their design. I mean, who who doesn't want to make a little money on the side? So I thought about the um, corporate implications, or more like the corporate applications of this. So it'll be it's actually possible to inter interact with or integrate logos into these sort of designs as well, where logos could move and have motions and kind of tell a story on their own as well, or even develop and explode over time. So yeah, so Tangerine was, was a really fun project to work on. And uh, moving on to the next design of mine, um, Crawl. So Crawl is um, something very psychedelic. Uh, psychedelic art is also something that I find very interesting. And I'm always um, amazed by psychedelia and the psychedelic art that I see online. So Crawl was my first foray into how I could kind of incorporate psychedelic art into my designs. And I, what I wanted to do was actually create a, a war shield. So Crawl, the design of Crawl is actually a war shield. So think of like a warrior holding a shield. 
and uh, the shield would actually expand and um, basically shelter and protect them as they go into battle. So that's the concept behind crawl. And the motion also created that kind of design and com uh, composition, basically. So the next one is actually mask. Again, moving still still in the same light of the war warrior kind of concept. So mask is actually a, a warrior mask where the, the warrior would wear something that would, would um, I guess, evolve over time to kind of change depending on the situation they, would, they were in. So the mask would actually change depending on the environment. The mask would change depending on the, the person they were interacting with and so on. So it's a very modular sort of mask design. So yeah, mask is pretty straightforward. It's, it's a mask that kind of evolves and changes over time. So even this design, it's incorporated with a lot of geometrical shapes, um, a lot of um, squares and distorted squares. And I was playing with a lot of opacity, rotation. And I was also trying to kind of play with the 3D plane so you could actually see the, the mask actually sort of 3D rotate in a way to, to signify that it's evolving or changing or adapting to the environment that the person wearing it would be in. So um, then after that, I decided, you know what, I've, do, I've done a lot of pop art and a lot of colorful art, and I wanted to go into some sort of, you know, dark cyberpunk dystopian influences. Uh, this was actually when um, one of the one of my favorite game studios, uh, CD Projekt Red, announced uh, Cyberpunk 2077. Uh, so all you video game lovers would know what I'm talking about. So Cyberpunk 2077 really impressed me, and I was thinking, you know, like it would be so cool to see cyberpunk being incorporated into motion graphics. So I wanted to kind of uh, envision how I would incorporate cyberpunk and dystopian influences into my motion graphics. So I created a set of nine designs, which is uh, three, three of them is what you can see on screen right now, which are basically changes um, over uh, Overlord as well as Omega. Um, changes is basically interface that actually expands and blows up in your face while you're working on it. So it's something that when you can click on it and it kind of pops up, uh, really reminiscent of something like a, what you would see in Minority Report, the movie with Tom Cruise, where he would interact with that, that virtual interface that's in front of him. So it could also be incorporated into something like augmented reality as well. Um, Overlord is is obviously a dystopian character, which uh, basically is um, is a character that has a giant monitor on its head, and it's it is sort of like um, George Orwell's Big Brother in in a way. Uh, those of you who have read uh, 1984 by George Orwell, um, Big Brother is a very symbolic uh, character. He's, the, the crazy thing is that Big Brother is not even a character; it's a system that's been incorporated by the dystopian uh, civilization, but the big brother is always watching. So my idea of Overlord was a, a, an entity or a person that's always watching as you live your daily life. And finally, Omega is the city itself, the ever-evolving, ever-growing city that is in that cyberpunk world that we live in. So this, this particular city explodes over time. It, it changes, it adapts to the different ways of living, the different people, the different cultures that live in this particular city. So as you can see, cyberpunk and dystopian influences are very strong in these three designs of mine. And I also wanted to kind of incorporate that, that static kind of design in my first two designs. If you notice that changes and overlord has this static uh, design happening or the static animation, which is really reminiscent of an old broken television. So that's something that I really wanted to try to incorporate into the design together with a lot of neons. Because I mean, whenever you look at anything cyberpunk, you tend to see a lot of neon lights and neon explosions in the sky as well. So um, the next project I expanded on was actually to do fluid motions or blending gradients with motion. So what I wanted to do is actually uh, embed my love of typography into my motion graphic design. So I created another uh, set of designs, which is basically nine designs. Um, I'm, I'm showcasing three here, which is uh, React, Fluid, and Lights. So the, the concept behind this, these designs are basically, the, the background itself is basic darkness but you have these little bursts of gradients that appear over time and slowly kind of evolve and uh, merge and kind of like blend together. And uh, it really makes the text 
kind of stand out and really makes the text pop as well. So the idea behind the text is also that it's it's moving. It has motion on it, uh, very reminiscent of 3D text. So you'll notice I, I also like to incorporate a glitch art as well. Uh, glitch art is really becoming big right now. And um, a, lot of, a lot of designers are trying to incorporate glitch art into their work. So I also thought that, you know what, this is a good opportunity for me to try to kind of put in glitch into my work as well. So this was the project that I really had a lot of fun working on. And uh, you can actually see a lot of the other designs on Instagram as well uh, for this particular project of mine. So the, the concept behind React is basically a, a, a cloud and a cloud that's that's evolving and changing colors and uh, changing in shapes and its size and form as well. Fluid is obviously motion fluid. So um, if you were to spill some sort of liquid and how that liquid would kind of flow and how that liquid could kind of, would kind of interact with each other and especially when the liquid had various different colors kind of interacting with them as well. And light is obviously the bursts of light and the explosions of light and how that light would kind of um, expand over time as well. Right, so uh, as part of the same project, I also wanted to kind of experiment with organic objects because um, I really, I never really experimented with organic objects till very recently. So um, I thought flower patterns or floral patterns would be something that I I would really want to incorporate into my motion graphics. So I created these three designs, which is Sublime, Prime, and Reverie. So um, basically these are, think of it as organic flowers that slowly, um, grow over time and expand and um, basically just bloom in a way as well. So I really wanted to infuse these organic florals in this motion. And, and I, I, I personally believe that the, the outcome came out pretty well and I, I got pretty good responses from it as well. So this is another design style that I might actually go back to in the future, uh, infusing organic patterns, organic natural patterns into my design as well. So I'm really excited to work on other projects which allow me to use these kind of styles too. So uh, you'll also notice there's a lot of circular uh, or basic uh, geometrical shapes in this as well, because that's that's something that I tend to use a lot in my designs, geometrical shapes. So in uh, Sublime, there's these circles that are kind of moving. With Prime, you have these uh, very um, abstract object or shapes that are kind of glitching and kind of flashing over time with, with, the, with the circular floral pattern slowly emerging from the background. With Reverie, on the other hand, you have the sunflower kind of blooming, and then you have the circular pattern combined with the abstract uh, square object as well. So um, now moving on to something very different. So um, I actually came across a very interesting quote by Robert Genn. Robert Genn is actually a landscape painter. Um, he talked about the brilliance of art as a collectible is that it has a way of reaching out on an emotional level. So I really got myself thinking about the kind of things or the kind of art that we collect. You know, what do we hang on the walls of our homes? Like what are the kind of things that we put up on the walls of our homes and the kind of things that we look at on a daily basis or, or you know, why are we actually purchasing art? And uh, if you think about the Jackson Pollocks of this world, I mean, people spend millions buying uh, famous Jackson Pollock artworks. And why do we buy those artworks? There must be some sort of emotion tied to it. So for me, I really felt that the, the only way or one of the ways that art could Tie my tie back to me in an emotional level was if it would evolve and change depending on the way I felt on the day itself, or it would evolve and uh, every day when I look at the art, I find something different inside it. So this came to my next um, design style, which is actually moving objects. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to actually create a set of designs which kind of symbolize what you would hang on your living room wall. But the, the caveat here was that this design would move and uh, morph and change over time. And, you know, wouldn't it be nice to actually look at these pictures hanging on the wall and every day when you look at it, you learn something new about the design. You find some intricate detail which you did not see yesterday and you suddenly see it today. It will really, you know, kind of give value to the art as well. So this uh, motion object, project of mine really got me thinking about this particular style of art forms where we could have uh, art pieces that hung on walls that would move. Obviously, I mean, this technology may not exist right now. I mean, maybe in the near future, or maybe we could mount 
huge monitors on our wall, which costs a lot of money to actually do and have art that changed over time and evolved over the course of your life, basically. So um, this is another piece that I worked on. And uh, this one incorporates a lot of color and a lot of pop art as well. So I wanted the art to um, start off with a very black and white dull motion, but over time it would just pop. And I also wanted to incorporate my, my love for UI UX. So I added that load bar in there. And then I also incorporated, incorporated a lot of moving objects into this particular design. And um, you will notice that after a while when the, when the load bar it, goes over time and then that's when the the colors start popping out of the the design itself so uh, wouldn't you like to have something like this hanging on your wall i i personally would rather than seeing a static you know piece of art uh, on on my wall so obviously this is this is a dream of mine so maybe in the future it might happen so this is another one. This is going back to Artemis. So um, again, you may have seen Artemis previously. So this is my conceptualization of how Artemis might look like on a billboard. Again, moving billboards is something that you see a lot today as well. So I wanted to kind of mock up how my Artemis interface would kind of look like in, in a moving billboard concept. So um, another really uh, powerful quote that I, I read was, the limitations of the real world is what makes art bigger than life. This is an anonymous quote. And um, it's true, you know, the limitations of the real world is what makes art bigger than life. Because um, all the art that you look at is always something that is so much bigger. Art tends to look so much more uh, livelier than what you would see in the real world. It's so much more explosive. Even photography is an art form, but when you when someone takes a photo, you will notice that it, it speaks so much more than when you would actually look at look at the place in, in you know being there at that time or at that place itself. So um, this particular project of mine, Bastion, was actually incorporating a pixel art into the same concept of having moving art pieces that you could hang on your wall. So Bastion also incorporated that load bar, which slowly loaded up, and then the, the art would explode and change and evolve over time as well. So um, this is something that I really want to maybe do in the future, uh, which is maybe have a moving art gallery where my art would actually move and evolve and people would visit and would actually be able to see moving art in my gallery. And as they walked by, they could actually see the art moving and changing and evolving and truly appreciate the art for what it is. So it's a very visual heavy art form, I would say. So, um, so before I get to the end of my um, presentation here, I just want to share some resources with some designers just to add some value to this. Uh, to this. So um, some of the resources that I personally use, uh, Defont. Defont is actually a very good website for you to uh, get fonts and typography. Um, I love fonts. I have more than 300 fonts on my computer, but I only use five of them maybe six when I'm feeling good or when I'm feeling like it uh, or when I'm feeling you know, experimental. But having a good library of fonts is really, really helpful for a designer because it lets you kind of explore and experiment with different styles and different techniques as well. So the font is my go-to site for picking up fonts. Um, Unsplash.com is actually a great resource for you to actually pick up um, crowdsourced photography. Now, all the photography that you get on unsplash.com is of high quality. They're amazing. They're taken by really, really good photographers, and all of them are free. You can use these photos for commercial as well as non-commercial work, and you do not need to credit the author, but you should credit the author if you if you use them, because obviously it's always good to get credit when credit's due. So uh, unsplash.com is something that I, I highly recommend if, you, if you're looking for uh, photos to kind of incorporate into your designs or even uh, stock images that you, you, you know, if you're, if you're a broke designer like me at one point and you didn't have money to buy an account in uh, like, uh, what are the Getty images and so on. Unsplash is a really good option for you because the, the photos are really high quality. Uh, the next one is actually color.adobe.com. Um, color.adobe.com is actually a color palette website. So what it does is it basically gives you color palettes. So uh, sometimes when I when I get stuck on a design and I can't really think of what color to use, sometimes I cheat and I visit 
Adobe color.com uh, or color.adobe.com and try to find some very interesting color palettes that I can either create myself or I can find that's been shared by someone else. And the last resource that I want to share is actually It's Nice That. So It's Nice That is actually a blog that's created by Google themselves. And It's Nice That is a really good resource for designers because it's a site that shares a lot of trending topics about design. It shares a lot of ideas behind why designs were created this way. It expands from industrial design to visual effects, to animation, to dis, uh, digital advertising, all the way to graphic design as well. So it encompasses all these different fields into one great portal where you can find a lot of great stories and stuff that you can that you can read about. Okay, so, um, and last but not least, uh, some advice for aspiring designers. I would say experiment and explore new design styles. This is really important. Uh, get yourself out there, try new things, try and incorporate new styles of design into the work that you do. Uh, get your designs out there for people to see. This is also very important. Don't just design stuff and save it on your computer or keep it in a scrapbook and no one's looking at it. Um, scan those, upload those, put them somewhere where the public can see because it's really important for you as a designer to get feedback, also to get um, their opinions about your designs as well, because this will really help you immensely in the future. Uh, the next thing is that collaborate and communicate with other designers. This is something I do on a daily basis. I communicate with a lot of designers on Instagram. I work with them. I give them um, suggestions. We even have our design critique sessions where uh, we have these groups where we can share our designs and then we, we, we talk about each other's designs. We give feedback, we give suggestions, we give ideas, we give opinions. And then when the time comes, we even get to collaborate with each other because it's really great and fun to work with other people. I mean, sometimes I, I, I need a texture or a textured background and I, and I go to the designer and I'm like, hey, um, I really like this texture that you've created for this project. Do you mind if I use it for my own project? And the cool, cool thing about Instagram and other platforms is that most of the designers are willing to share their work with you. And all you need to do is credit them. And credit is always always welcome at the end of the day. Okay. The next thing is that it's never too late to learn a new technique or software. Because I mean, like me, I learned After Effects at a very late stage in my life. But it's something that I'm always learning and I'm I'm still learning until today. And I'm still evolving my styles and my techniques and so on. So the same way with softwares, you should always um, learn new things. And this is not specific to designers as well. Uh, it's open to anyone. So if you're a, if let's say, for example, you're, you're a designer, it's a, it's probably a good time for you to maybe even look at programming as an option uh, because the world is evolving. Our skill sets are diversifying. Um, a lot of designers are now going into data and so on as well. So data could be something that you may want to look at. So it's never too late to learn a new technique or a software. Now, the next thing, this is something that I really, really think that you need to do. Build an audience by posting consistently. Um, I make it a point to post designs on a daily basis. Um, yeah, sometimes I don't have the time to do it, but I try to make it a point to do it. Uh, what I do is I usually design my work on weekends. So I, I work on like a lot of designs on weekends and then I get them curated by my group, get some ideas, get some opinions from them, get them to uh, give me some thoughts about it. And then I start posting them every day on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, and finally, obviously the most important thing, enjoy what you do. Obviously, it's always good to enjoy what you do. Um, what better way is it when you can turn your, your hobby into a career, into your passion and into more than just that as well. So really enjoy what you do and, and do it for the love of it more than just anything else, I would say. So um, yeah, let's collaborate. Um, this is how you can get in touch with me. Uh, you can find me on Instagram, Harsha underscore Rao. Um, you can visit my website, which is uh, still in, you know, I'm still putting stuff up on it, uh, harsharao.net. I also have a Behance page, uh, behance.net, Harsha underscore Rao. Um, Oh, yes. Another thing. I also make music. Uh, I make a lot of experimental music. Um, I post this music onto SoundCloud. Uh, in fact, the trailer that you watch for this 
this session, that, that song is actually created by me as well. Uh, I go by the handle Action Bass because I love to use a lot of drum and bass in my in my projects. So if you want to check out some of my music, you can also check it out on SoundCloud. Uh, my handle is Action Bass as well. Uh, and finally, if you want, you can send me an email. I'll gladly reply to you. Uh, hr11285 at gmail.com. You can see it on your screen. Uh, take a screenshot if you need to remember it. Um, and if you if you have your phone with you, just scan that QR code. And most importantly, let's collaborate because the world is going to get better when designers work together. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to uh, run this uh, webinar series with you guys. Um, yeah, thank you. All right, thank you very much, Harsha, for that very insightful uh, sharing session. Um, thank you. I wow, hope I didn't amazing. go over time. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Um, no, I, I, I feel like I've I've known you on a different level after uh, after I've heard all of your descriptions about okay. about your um, you know presentation just now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. Before that, um, hello everyone. Um, it's me again, uh, Fitri. And I, I would be, <laughs> I would be doing uh, a little bit of recap about the, the presentation that Harsha have, has has given us, you know, earlier. Now, um, not I'm gonna highlight some points here. The 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 one of the things that I really thoroughly enjoyed the most is that I actually get the answer, um, based on the question that you have proposed earlier for yourself. You know, being a a logo designer or a graphic designer. You know, um, of course, um, at that point, um, there were a lot of, of, of logos that you have designed, like you have created, you know, logo designs, you have dwell in that, in that, like, 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 you know, that pot, that particular pot where you get a lot of clients, you get, you get a lot of job done. And eventually, you know, I think a lot of artists, a lot of, you know, creative individuals, they would, you know, come to this um, junction where they ask themselves, uh, what else is there for me or what else can I do in order for me to, to make myself satisfied? You know, because mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the reasons, uh, a lot of times when people are creating art, me included, especially, uh, you know, towards, you know, all the, the people who have done it, especially for people who have done it like in multiple cycle, multiple terms, they, they, they tend to be asking the question where else they could go or where else I can go in this in this matter. Mm -hmm. So so I think it's it's great for me to see that you actually have uh, already found your answer about what else you can create for yourself. Right. Um you know um one thing to one thing to 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 break away from your norm, you know, breaking away from from the cycle or the the routine that you have, you know, put yourself working with logo designs, and you know maybe other graphic design uh, works as well. Um, okay, so uh, another point that I would like to highlight is that you tend to be um, more uh, artistic driven compared to graphic design driven. You know, hence the reason why today's topic is art in motion graphics, of course. Um, um, I know that a lot of people uh, find that, you know, motion graphic is just moving images, moving pictures or moving design. But you actually have shown that it is actually possible uh, for designers or for artists to incorporate a lot of artistic approach. You know, because when you go to school, when you learn it in class, you're talking about design elements and design principles. Mm -hmm. And, you know, using... I. I from what I see, you know, you have actually applied all the design elements and design principles into your art and creating a piece of art that is very individualistic. And it's very, you know, it spoke, it spoke volume about who you are as a person, um, you know, like citing the, the um, HP Lovecraft as the creator of Cthulhu, for example, mm -hmm. or um, the H, what's the movie again, 117? A THX 1138. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Okay. THX 1138. So actually, yeah. um, you know, upon upon you citing those yeah. movies just now, I actually went on and and did a little bit of read up mm. on on those on those um, references. Right. Um, I feel like you know it's very important for us as artists not only to know where we are going next, but also where we come from. Yeah. All right. So mm -hmm. it's very uh, it's very interesting for for me. Okay, to know that that you have actually, um, you know, uh, you have a good um, grasp of who you are as an artist, you know, you know where you're going, 
and then you know where you come thank from. Thank you. So I think thank there's a very, very good quality of of a good artist. And yeah, um, before I I continue with the session, I think um, I have a few questions for you, and I hope mm -hmm. that you can answer them. Okay. Uh, first okay. of all, because because we both are from the the design field or the art field. And mm -hmm. we teach a lot of artistic, um, or no, we, we create or we practice um, in producing a lot of artistic artworks, yeah. right? And um, oftentimes we would find ourselves in a position or in a situation where we, we would uh, be blocked because of, like I mentioned earlier, it's about the routine, okay? Mm -hmm. It's about the repetitive process. And eventually you, the, the mental block or the creative block is, is going to somehow attack or um, it's somehow going to come and, and face you as an as an mm -hmm. artist. Like like so in your situation, what would you do or what are the actions that you would take in order for you to overcome uh, such problems that that might happen? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so the 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 straightforward answer is probably Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think a lot of people do that. So yeah, I, I do watch a lot of movies to kind of overcome creative blocks. Uh, I start playing with shapes. Like, so I'll open up like Adobe Illustrator and like suddenly just randomly drop shapes inside and then see what these shapes kind of form and then kind of build upon it as well. Uh, besides that, I, I do a bit of reading too. Um, like I like to read a lot of blogs as well. So like the one I mentioned just now, it's nice that that's, that's a go-to for me when I get a like, creative block sometimes but music movies video games really help as well because uh, it, it really makes the creative juices start moving and it really gives you like a lot of inspiration as well so yeah looking back at what inspires me that helps me uh kind of overcome my creative block i would say yeah okay okay cool. okay thank you very much so uh, mm -hmm. i can see that we have a, a question from sagitya um okay, okay this Hi, question sagitya. is from the the audience yeah so how mm -hmm. long do you prepare for these designs? Okay, Sagitya. So it really depends on how complex the designs are. Um, sometimes when I'm on a roll, it might take me like maybe three, four hours. And sometimes I have to kind of, if, if I, if sometimes when a design is really complex, I'll have to like kind of say, okay, I got to stop because uh, I'm, I'm kind of tunnel visioned. I've got to look at it tomorrow and see if I can do better. Because sometimes I, I one one thing about designers is that you'll tend to hate the stuff you do when you look at it for the first time. So some designs, when it's a bit complex, you will look at it and you're like, oh, this is this is atrocious. I want to look at it again tomorrow and try again tomorrow. So yeah, so it depends on the complexity of the design. So sometimes it might take me one to three hours. Sometimes it might even take me days. Really depends. Yeah. All right. So thank you very much uh, for, for that response. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so the next question from Sumida yeah. Chaudhuri. Uh, okay, hi Sumida. Feel free of cost softwares. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, so free softwares for yeah. which can be downloaded for practicing graphic design at, you know, at the beginners level. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to share some, but I think Fitri, you can also share some because you yeah. are quite resourceful, yeah. Um, so the ones I normally recommend is uh, Canva. Uh, Canva is a really great online mm. tool. So you can go to canva.com. Um, it works on your browser. So a lot of times when I need to do some design work and I don't have a computer, like sometimes I even had to design a poster. And it's hilarious because I'll get a client of mine saying like, we need a poster uh, and we need it like in an hour. And I'm like, oh crap, I'm outside. I'm not in front of my computer. What do I do? I go on to canva.com, I make a poster, I send it to them, it works. <laughs> yeah, so uh, canva.com is really cool for you to kind of experiment and explore graphic design. Uh, Paint 3D is also a free software right now. It's it's a evolution of Microsoft Paint. It's really good. It allows you to do 3D shapes as well. So you can do 3D art with it to Paint 3D. Um, Fitri, do you have any other suggestions? Yeah, I think um, at the beginning level, at the beginner's level, when I yeah. first started um, my my journey as, as an artist, you know, creating designs, creating uh, artworks, I used uh, GIMP, G-I-M-P. Oh, yes, GIMP, so, yeah. yeah. So yeah. because Canva is more online-based, where mm -hmm. it's a very contemporary tool, I would say, where you use, uh, uh, you know, your, your browser, Google yes, Chrome that's right. or Internet yeah. Explorer and mm -hmm. and then just find Canva and it will be available for you mm -hmm. through your browser. Yeah. But if you want something that is more set in stone and you mm -hmm. want something to 
so that you don't have even that you can work even without the access the internet access yeah uh, you can try out gimp and GIMP, also yeah. if i'm not mistaken inkscape inkscape yeah, is also one, good yes true inkscape yeah. is for vector yeah so but, there are there are actually a plethora of free mm -hmm. softwares that true. you can use in order for you to yeah. produce images true actually there's another one more i wanted to recommend uh for animation it's actually called google web designer uh, it allows you to do HTML5 animation. So you can actually create animations on the platform and then publish it to your browser itself. So it would run as a HTML5 file rather than a video file. So that's also a pretty cool free software. Um, then if you want to do things like uh, motion graphics and stuff, a lot of people tend to use Blender, I heard, but I don't really use Blender much, but I've heard of it. I have never used it per se. All right. Okay. Um, now we're moving on to the next question mm -hmm. uh, by Swastik Sahu. As a designer, you have worked with a lot of clients. Mm -hmm. Has it occurred to you at some point that what the changes the client has suggested is not good and has hampered your creativity? Now, I think this question is being asked a lot by, by us designers as well. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what is your response to us? Hi, Swastik. Um, so this is a very common thing that happens, okay? Uh, I get this thing where the, the client always tells you, like, make the, des make the design pop. I don't know, you may have heard that meme online as well. Um, yes, it hampers your creativity. And sometimes you really need to think, is this a client that you really want to work with? When the client is telling you to kind of... Um, take your creativity away or even make changes that you don't personally agree with. But you also have to remember that a client is always right, but the client doesn't really know what they want. And you as a designer has to be have to be able to actually tell the client, this is what they want. This is what they need for their project. And this is how the design should be. So uh, I think communication is something that uh, all designers should be should have and have to be good at communicating why your design is the best option for the client. Yep. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you on the communication. Not only that that the design should communicate the information, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you should be able to communicate your ideas and your 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 point of view towards um, the yes, the, that's right towards your client as well. Yeah. yeah. All right, so the next question is from Fadila Konita. I think we both know who this person Hi, is. Hi, Fadila. <laughs> yeah. students. Yep. Thank you for your question. Yeah, um, she asked, do you have any tips and tricks on making a moving logo for self-branding? Okay, so uh, when you do a logo, um, you probably are going to be using uh, Illustrator for it, right? So now when you design a logo in Illustrator, you have different elements in the logo. Now, when all those elements are in, uh, separated into different layers, you then take them into After Effects, for example, then you actually are able to then start moving those objects around and manipulating those objects around and creating some really interesting stuff. So tips and tricks, uh, it really depends on the logo itself. But uh, a lot of times I use things like uh, the effects that are already there in um, After Effects, like transform effects. Then another one that I've been experimenting a lot with is turbulence, uh, turbulent displays, because it allows me to create turbulence in my uh, art. So you could also do turbulence for your logo to create glitch effects. Uh, playing with gradients also helps. That's another great way to kind of create moving logos. Uh, if your logo is not 3D and it's 2D, then you really have to kind of think how you can play with the transforms and the turbulence and also the various other effects. Uh, also, CC bubble action. That's a really fun. <laughs> Sorry, ball action. Yeah, my bad. <laughs> Okay, so, um, okay, uh, very interesting uh, yeah. question. Thank you, Fadila Konita. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. I think I think before I ask the next question, I'm going to ask you one question that, that I have for uh, for you. All right, sure. um, this is due to the fact that, that you have been working in the industry and you have been working um, both as a, as a designer, as an artist, as well as you have been working as a lecturer, right? Mm -hmm. So um, how do you keep yourself... Uh, on the edge, like for example, how do you keep yourself um, relevant and always be on the on the contemporary? Contemporary meaning that you're always living, you know, at the moment. Because mm -hmm. of course, um, with the amount of experience that you have, um, times have changed since you yes. first started. So yeah. we all came from the the late '90s, early 2000s uh, scene, okay, design mm -hmm. scene. Okay. Maybe your your method and my methods are different, but what about you? How do you keep yourself uh, relevant and contemporary? 
Well, um, that's a very good question with a very difficult answer, I would say. <laughs> um, it's it's obviously very difficult to keep yourself relevant, but what you should do as a designer is I always keep abreast with what's happening in the design world, you know? So always, you, you have to remember that you don't work in a bubble. No designer works in a bubble. And if you're working in a bubble, then there's something wrong there, okay? You need to go out and look at what other designers are doing. Uh, this is why I love Instagram as a platform and all new designers really get onto Instagram because there's so many designers already there. And by looking at what they do, it kind of helps you evolve your style. It kind of helps you, um, like, even, even imagine what your design could be and also gives you an idea of what is accepted in, like, Right now, like uh, one of our great contemporary contemporary Instagram artists is actually Boss Logic. So Boss Logic is one of those crazy designers who does a lot of crazy stuff. And you know what? I want to get to that level of Boss Logic, but to become Boss Logic, you need to you need to have it, you know. And yeah, um, I I follow Boss Logic. I I comment on his work. I, I I like his work. And that's the thing. As a designer, you really need to know what's being designed out there. What's actually being place uh, not just in terms of the advertising section or the the movies the videos but even uh independent designers what are they doing what are they posting uh another great website is treadless looking at t-shirts that also helps because you can see what what's in trend in terms of fashion um it's also good to kind of play with pop culture like uh recently we had may the 4th for the international star wars day so you start, started seeing a lot of star wars designs online so, you know, that's when you should also try to kind of play with that team and, you know, try to incorporate that design, that, that concept into your design as well. Yeah. All right. Nice. Okay. So I think um, I'm going to continue asking the questions from the audience. Sure. Uh, this question is from Henry Victor. When you Hi, design, Henry. do you keep in mind the audience it is meant for? Okay. Um, so the thing about my designs is that uh, I don't actually know who my audience is. Okay, so let me go go answer that question so bluntly. I'm creating these designs and this content for anybody. Okay, so the designs are my interpretations of the topics that I want to talk about. So the audience I keep in mind is yes, I have I have about close to about 700 plus followers on Instagram. They follow, some of them follow me because they like my designs and uh, a lot of them engage with me because they like my designs. But uh, I don't actually design for an audience because uh, I'm the audience, I'm designing for myself. Yeah. And if you like my designs then create, I've, you know, killed two birds with one stone in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um... I'm not sure how to pronounce the name, so I'm just going to try. It's okay. 3GN. Hi, um, 3GN. He said, uh, or he, he or she said, very interesting session. Mm -hmm. Can we see any tutorial video or a demo of the way you work in After Effects? Okay, uh, I've not actually done any tutorial videos or demos as of yet, but that's something I'm actually looking at exploring in the future. Uh, that's something I'm really looking at, especially now with a lot of online digital learning and a lot of uh, universities having to teach uh, a lot of things online. Uh, I think it's it's probably a very good time for P uh, educators like you and me, Fitri, like to start yeah. creating content, uh, especially things like motion graphics, animation, and start posting it online. And for people like 3GN to actually experience, so it is something that I have in the pipeline. I don't know when because you know there's so many things to do and so little time. But yes, definitely is something I really want to do one day. Yeah. And another thing that another idea that I had, um, maybe for your for your Instagram mm -hmm. content is to. To actually create like a time lapse, you know, of the, mm. the creation of your, of yeah. your uh, artwork and, and yeah. such. So, but the problem yeah, with time know, lapse uh, is sorry, sorry to cut you off, but the problem with time lapse is that yeah. when I work, right, I work with a lot of things where I'll start working on something and then I'll scrap something completely and I'll start from scratch. So, and then sometimes I'll delete <laughs> stuff. Uh, so there's a lot of chaos in my design, of in course, my in my right. my yeah. pipeline or in my process, I guess. So it might not you know, uh, work well with the audience. But yes, I, I want to do time-lapse time, time -lapse videos. I, I totally agree with you as well. It's something that I should definitely work, look into doing. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, we have a lot of questions today. Yeah. So, yeah, okay. The next, the next question from the audience is uh, Shida Zubaida. Sir, do Hi, you suggest Shida for ProQuit Co Collapse? Um, I think before that, we have to explain what ProQuit Co is. 
Uh, I think it's like when you do a collab and you get something out of it. Uh, so it's it's a very difficult question to answer because when you say pro quit pro, what is your what is your return? What what are you trying to get in return? Is it a monetary value or are you looking at experience? What exactly are you looking at? So when you say pro quit co collapse, if someone wants to collaborate with you and they're saying, hey, design my logo for me, but you learn in ex you gain experience, then maybe you're not getting what you should be getting because they're probably going to start using that logo for commercial purposes. But if someone says, you know, like, let's do a collaboration where we create some sort of art work or something, then you know that it's not going to be, you know, something that someone is going to make money off of. So really think about what the person is using your design for. That's very, very important before you agree on collapse. Because I've had so many situations where people come to me and say, hey, you're a logo designer. Can you design a logo for me? Sure, I can design a logo for you, but it it'll cost you. But depends again if you're a, if you're like a friend or if you're you're doing something like an NGO or a nonprofit. Then sometimes we might think you know like it's okay to give something out for free. But really, as your designer, your time is very valuable. So really think what kind of projects you're working on, because you're never never going to gain that time back again. Yeah. Yeah, I think in I think in in this case, right, whenever you you collaborate with a designer. Um, mm -hmm. You know, looking on the bright side, there's always something for you to learn. You know, mm -hmm. you, there's always something for you to to gain from. You know, and and there's always uh, you know new things. Because yeah. Artistic art, art and design is a very subjective mm -hmm. uh, okay. matter, okay, especially yeah. for us to learn. Yeah. So yeah, uh, thank you very much. So the next question is from Ah Manjunata Reddy. Is Hi, there Manjunata. a community or group like WhatsApp on design aspects? Okay, um, I don't know of any WhatsApp groups, but on Facebook, there are many. Like, I'm actually part of the, the India Graphic Design Association, the Malaysia Graphic Design Association. I also am in the Freelance Designer Association. You can actually find a lot of graphic design groups in uh, on Facebook for your particular country as well. And then you can actually interact with designers from your own country there too, and also on a global scale. So... Uh, Facebook is actually a cool place for you to find communities and groups for graphic design. Uh, with Instagram, no, there's no communities per se. Uh, another platform that you might see a lot of communities popping up now is actually Discord. There are a lot of uh, graphic design uh, communities being created on Discord, and I'm actually part of a few, like uh, Cypher Catonic. Uh, if, you, if you follow me on Instagram, you might be able to find Cypher Catonic because I always talk about this particular group as well. So yeah, there, there are a few groups on Facebook. Um, as well as on Discord. Yeah. Hope that answers your question. All right, cool. So yeah, just uh, okay. I think this is this is our last question of today. Uh, mm -hmm. This is by Face. Uh, how is employment rate of motion or graphic designer in Malaysia? Okay. Hi, Viz. Um, so I don't know if you tuned in to last week's webinar session where uh, there was a alumni of us talking about freelancing. And I really think that the gig economy is going to explode right now. It's going to be something that a lot of designers are going to start getting into. Uh, honestly, a lot of companies are not seeing the, uh, I don't know if I should say not seeing the point, but the purpose of hiring full-time designers, but the gig economy is going to explode, and they're going to. There's going to be a lot of opportunities in freelance, and uh, especially in Malaysia, you're seeing more and more gig jobs coming up as well. And there's a lot of websites that are being uh, created for this purpose too. So in Malaysia, the design industry is still growing, it's still popping, uh, and it's just changing and evolving over time. And I don't think it's it's something that's like uh, being affected by COVID-19 either because uh, right now, digital advertising is big. You you see a lot of advertisements right now and you need designers to create this stuff for you anyways. So it is, it's going to definitely grow and grow and grow for sure. Yep. All right. Okay, cool. So, oh, okay. So there's Hi, a very, uh, another question. I think this is 3GM. So okay, yeah. I'll call I'll call you Nirmal for now. Hi Nirmal. Um, yeah. Thank you for answering my previous question. Do you use any plugins for your work? If yes, then any free plugin sites. Uh, I have seen a lot of plugins, but I don't use any plugins in my work. Um, actually, recently I've been learning a new uh, software. It's actually a free software. It's called Mandel Bulb. 
M-A-N-D-E-L, B-U-L-B. Okay, you can Google it. It's actually based on the Mandelbulb fractal art. Uh, Mandelbulb is actually a mathematical algorithm that is used to create fractal art. So you can actually download this software, which allows you to create fractal art. And then you can actually take this art and put it into other softwares and then start manipulating it using either Photoshop, Illustrator, After Effects, and so on. So no, I don't use any plugins, but I've, I do experiment with things like Mandelbulb and Mandelbulber as well. Yeah. You can find it online. Right. So, uh, all right. Thank you very much. Yeah. And I think that's all the questions that we have. Hi, Edwin. Hello, Edwin. Hi. Nice to see you. Again. you. Thank you very much, Asha and uh, Fiti. No problem. Uh, um, if I have to put it in um, one word, uh, colorful, mind blowing design. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That's thank you. Very, very simple. Thanks, guys. Uh, uh, for a person who is not into too much of art, uh, like me, uh, this uh, session was definitely uh, eye-opener uh, in terms of how you actually have uh, grown up from a, for, to put a 2D design and then uh, giving it life uh, with motion. That's what I see. So a 2D flat design uh, popping out colorfully with all your motion graphics uh, techniques that uh, you have used. And uh, more importantly, the emotions that you want to send across to the audience uh, with those uh, effects and motions. Uh, Kudo so. and, uh, wonderful. Uh, thank you very much for this. Uh, and uh, uh, Fitri, thank you for being an amazing uh, co-host, uh, eliciting answers from Mr. Asha and uh, the wonderful audience. Uh, um, for being with us uh, for this session. And definitely, we had tried to answer most of your questions. I'm sorry if I missed uh, your question. But I, I remember there was one question, when, one interesting question I skipped to actually share with you. So I'm going to ask you that question. There was a question sure. from the audience uh, uh, where the, uh, the question was, Mr. Asha, when are you going to uh, do your first uh, museum i mean uh, <laughs> art gallery yeah your first art exhibition wow yeah i i that that that's something that i really want to do i just need to find someone who's willing to you know invest in me i guess yeah you know i i would love to do that actually uh, i would even be able to create curated pieces for an art art piece or an art show definitely something i i really want to do in the future so i don't know when per se but it's something that i really am passionate about Thank you. Hoping, uh, hoping, Mr. Asha, to see your uh, art exhibition soon. Uh, Thank you, guys. Or, or maybe uh, in, a, in a physical uh, environment as well. Mm -hmm. um, on that note, I, I would like to uh, bring to you what's coming up for the next week. Um, I did mention this uh, the pre uh, previous week as well. Uh, the next week is going to be an interesting session, just like what we had with Mr. Asha today, uh, but on, on the VFX field. So I'm glad uh, that we will be having uh, Mr. As Dalal, UK director, uh, joining us for a live interview session uh, to share his experience as a as a science fiction movie director. So um, he uh, he's a self-taught uh, science fiction um, movie director. Uh, and and if I could uh, mention it, uh, he's a common man's uh, science fiction uh, movie director. Why do I say that is? Because he does his movie from his house. That's all. Wow, amazing. Uh, yeah. awesome. So we have a lot of things to learn from him because he, he, uh, he can actually tell you, give you tips on how you can do an awesome science fiction movie uh, in low budget, if I had to put it. And uh, he's a very, very technically sound person who, is, uh, who uses uh, latest technology uh, uh, to inside in his uh, movie making. So this, I promise you, is going to be a very, very good uh, session for all budding movie directors, um, uh, people, who, uh, students who are doing visual communication, VFX, uh, uh, digital film uh, and animation. So this is your chance to actually um, connect live with Asadawal and ask your questions. Uh, I'd like to sh uh, share one of his uh, uh, trailers to you. Uh, so in a second.
understand the classified nature of this mission and the legal non-disclosure agreements that you signed which prohibit you from ever discussing this project to anyone outside this room. I understand. And to understand the nature of this program. Yes, I'm fully aware. This is light and cosmic matter entering and leaving. So what we're potentially looking at here is a wormhole. And we believe that this activity uh, occurred at the same time as the strange dark orbs that have been appearing in our skies. We're talking about probably one of the most important things that has happened in space exploration. And I think we need to move forward on that. I think we need to move forward now. We could be looking at first contact with intelligent life. It's the possibility of something else out there for us. It changes everything. It's that simple notion which drives the Human 2.0 project. could not have been more wrong about all of this. Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> so that's uh, the beyond from Mr. Asdala. It's one of his uh, um movies and he has quite worked in a lot of uh, hollywood series especially with disney and uh, we at apu asia pacific university are actually proud that uh, we had an opportunity to work with them for one of the sequence one of the scene which we actually shoot shot in our school uh, terrace so uh, that was a wonderful experience for one of the movies that we are able to work. So he's going to share a lot of this experience of how you, he grow, grew to, to this level uh, in, the, in the film world. So please do join us uh, next week uh, for this amazing session. Uh, uh, the live session link will be available in our YouTube channels, format uh, at APU. Uh, so please do connect it. I would also send you an inv invitation um, through the official channel that we are in connected with. On that note, thank you very much uh, and uh, uh, a wonderful Friday evening today uh, with Mr. Arsha and Fitri again. Thank you both of you. Thank you, uh, thank let's... you for having me. Have a great weekend. Uh, you too, yeah. Fitri. Have a great weekend, guys. Thank you. And uh, this is Edwin saying bye-bye. Take care. Bye. <laughs>